the biblical truth of our hymn. Today we're going to do a hymn I personally just don't like. And there are things in life that we don't like. I don't care too much for broccoli. I'll have it every once in a while. I'm, I'll sing Amazing Grace. I don't hate it. But um, this is the biblical truth of our hymns. And we're going to look at the truth of our hymns. Now, it was written by John Newton. He's a man that got saved, an Agoglin Agu uh, minister later. And he was a slave trader. He was caught, killed slaves. And it's a remarkable story of his testimony of getting saved. And it does lack one thing. If we're going to talk about amazing grace. It lacks the name of Jesus Christ. You don't see Jesus Christ in amazing grace. And I hope by the time that we come to the end of studying amazing grace, you'll find a great unbiblical fact about Amazing Grace that is sung in our Baptist Christian churches today. I have six stanzas of Amazing Grace. Many times your hymnals has three or four stanzas of Amazing Grace. There are six. One is unauthorized. I say, in my personal opinion, and we'll get to that in a moment. But when we do stanzas one through five, this is John Newton, the man that was a slave trader that got saved and is in glory. Amazing grace. And that's what it is. It's the grace of God. It's the love of God. For God so loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's God's grace. It's amazing grace. Why God would look upon as wicked as a person we are. I mean, how wicked are we before salvation? We're going to hell. God says, you don't need to go. What must I do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wrench, ooh, that's a bad word, like me. Come down to Mr. Newton, and the assurity of his salvation is how he looked at himself. Now, a wretch, back then, and I got uh, 1779, that, that was a terrible, vile word. I couldn't say some of the words that would equal that today. There'd be just curses and vile. And he's saying a wrench like me, I was as wicked, vile, just there would be other words that would be cur cursing and cussing. It would not be proper to use. I was a child of the devil. I was a child of wickedness. I was a child of sin. I was an enemy against God. I was a wrench. And he saved me. How did he save me? His amazing grace. I was once lost, but now I am found. Now, if you find that in the Bible, in a personal testimony of John Newton, that's taken from the prodigal son. There was a time the prodigal son had, his father had no idea where he was. So the scripture tells us he's down in the pig's, pig's pie. And he was lost. And he came to his senses and came home to the father. And, he, and the father said, my son was lost. Now he's found. There's scripture. Was blind, but now I see. In the, in the gospel of John, there's a man that was blind. And Jesus said, go wash. And he, he, he became to see. And he had trouble with the family. And he had trouble with his parents. He had trouble with the Pharisees. You know, is this man really born blind? Do you see? And his, his family didn't want to be rebuked by the Pharisees and not be able to go to the temple and, and, and still live in, in, in the Jewish community and all that. Well, he's of age still. 
That man told him, he said, listen, I am blind, but now I see. And he had never seen Jesus yet. He had not seen the eyes and the face of Jesus who saved him. He sees him later on. He gets much persecution and much suffering after he got his eyesight. That's the story of, of John Newton. And we don't have time to look at John Newton. But man, he, he was he was an owner of a slave ship. And I'm t I was told at one time when the troops or the soldiers were to, were to board his ship, he threw the slaves overboard and let them drown to save his life. And he came to Jesus Christ for salvation. Gospel. Stanza two. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. We, we, growing up, a little while, a little, little while ago, it was the most stupid thing ever. Bumper stickers ever. No fear. No fear. You know why we're not going to come out of coronavirus? We're coming to. No, you're not. Because you don't fear God. And next, you're going to be fearing the bumblebee or whatever that thing horn is. And then you'll be fearing the next thing. But you're not going to fear God. Few will go the road of the straight gate that leadeth to life. Many will go the broad way without fear. And they will not repent of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to save their souls. It's after salvation that God has taught us how he loves them. How much of what we understand after we're saved. All what God has done. Listen, what, the day I got saved, April 21st, 1987. You know what I knew? I am no longer going to hell. I am a sinner, and Jesus Christ saved my soul. You know what I know today? I know that I'm going to get a brand new body. I know I may not die one day. If, if the Lord doesn't tarry and the rapture comes, I'm going up without death. I know if I die, I'm still going up. And uh, upon salvation the Lord Jesus Christ, there is still much knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to get that the lost man can't get the lost man the world cannot get the Holy Spirit Jesus said and my fear I fear sinning even yes times of that sin that I enjoy I still times you know okay God I don't care and there's times I do it oh Lord and grace my fears relieve Fears of what? Dying, going to hell. Being absent. Whatever happened after, after, after death before I was saved. Being loved by God, being cared by God. Though I am lonely today, I, I'm not really lonely in God. Though I have an enemy called the devil and he's attacking. I've got fears. Listen, I don't want to mess with the devil. I don't have anything to do with him. I go in the power and the might of God. How precious did that grace appear. <coughs> Excuse me. The hour of first belief. I knelt down at my grandma's coffee table. And I felt clean. And then this instantly, you know, I was yelled at by my grandma because we put fingertips, fingerprints on her on her table. We moved her precious knickknacks. And it was sometime that week, I don't know, that day or whatever. I was just in the shower, you know, bathing, something I've always done. And it's just one moment, you know, I'm just washing myself. You know what? I feel a filth that's gone that... I've never cleaned before because I couldn't clean. And that's what grace, the amazing grace that saves our soul. We're clean. We're a child of God. We're adopted by the Father. Through many dangers, toils, and snares. And that is the life of John Newton. That's not... The real story of, of many and all Christians that sing this hymn. They may not have dangers, toils, and snares. 
the occupation that that Newton was involved in was was dangerous. It was torture. It was against the law. It was against human souls, human trafficking. Out in the out in the seas and pirates and all kinds of a lot of those pirate stories, you know, they're made up. But a lot of the pirate stories are true. You did not want to have them come boarding your ship. And then the, the storms of the oceans and the the, the mutiny of the uh, this it's a lot to behold. But this is a personal testimony and personal story of John Newton. I have already come. Tis great, tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And there's more troubles, more problems. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And from the day I get saved to the day I go home, what is keeping me going? What keeps you going? Grace. The children of Israel in the wilderness. There was times that God told Moses, I'm done with him. I'm finished. Back off. Moses stepped in there and said, well, God, what about the Egyptians? What will they say? What about the people in the land of Canaan? What will they say? God, you need to repent. Moses becomes a type of Jesus Christ. Intercessory. Intercession. And this, you know, God's grace, all right, God's mercy, I'll back off, God's long-suffering, grace. And grace will get grace that saved my soul. The grace that saved your soul. We're going home one day. We're going home. I wish they put in a capital H on that home. Amazing grace. Because it ain't just home. Home sweet home? No, there's a greater home coming. A home in the residence of God. A mansion. That's great. Mansion is grace. I don't deserve a mansion. I go prepare a place for you. Why? What worthy am I? Because I love you. What's the Satan what's Satan give you? And his he has no love. He gives you a pit. He gives you darkness, flame, torment. Stands it forward, the Lord has promised good to me. And I, I couldn't go through the good that he's given us. I couldn't go through the promises. We're coming a day, no more pain. How's that? How's that for a health care? President Obama, when he was in office, would give us health care. And he messed up the whole health care system. But God's going to give us the ultimate health care. Just get rid of the health. No more pain. No more sorrow. He's going to wipe away our tears, the Bible says in Revelation 21 and 22. How's that? Promise. I'll never leave you or forsake thee. Even if you, a saved Christian, you give up on God, you, you go astray, and you go off into the world, and you backslide. I mean, you're saved, you're saved, but you just, that's it, I'm done. God ain't done with you. Now, he may put you up on a shelf, because, but you're an adopted child. Even the laws of this country and the laws of England, adopted child, you cannot disinherit. Now, God may put you off. Listen, when that prodigal son, okay, that's what you want to do. I'm still your father. I don't know what the father, you know, you go and there's still a place here for you. When that son came home, when the son came home, there was a place for him. There were clothes, there were shoes, there was a party for him. Grace brought that young man home. Grace of God said, you need to repent and get right. Verse 5. Stands at 5. Yea. When this flesh and heart shall fail, death. One day, whatever cause you're going to die of, whatever, your blood is going to stop circulating. 
your heart is going to stop beating. And one of the first things they do, listen, I've I, I known this, I, I, two wives have died. No pulse. No, nope. I don't feel no pulse. What time is it? Okay. Your lungs will stop. However you die. You go to sleep, put your head on the pillow, have a nice good dream, and you absent from the body and present with the Lord. I don't feel any heartbeat. You wake up and you're in the torments of hell. And there's no pulse. Heart failure is in the Bible. Abigail's husband, Nabal, had a heart failure. And mortal life shall cease. Death life. Mortal. Death. Because death ain't the end. You realize that? When you have been conceived in your mother's womb, you're never going to die again. Oh, your body may die, whether you're stillborn or 110 years old. You take your last breath here. You take your 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 beginning breaths of eternal life. When a child has been conceived in the mother's womb, she that mother has populated heaven, or she's populated hell. <coughs> Listen, you may have somebody you've seen in a coffin. And they close that coffin and they're put in the ground and they're buried. That's not it. Where did they go? They went to heaven by Jesus. And they went or they went to hell by rejecting Jesus. Mortal life. And Christians today, us that are living today, we may not have that mortal life. Jesus Christ can come any moment. And when he comes, those are those that remain are caught up together with those that have died and sleep in the Lord. There's a series of Christians in the future that will not have a mortal life. They will be raptured like Enoch and Elijah. So Elijah's going to come back in the, in the tribulation period and he's going to die again. I shall possess within the veil. Where's the veil? Well, that's not only the place that Jesus rent, but where's the veil? I don't read my Old Testament Bible. Well, then you're missing a lot because that veil was the holy of holies of holies place. That's where the mercy seat was. That's where the cherubim were. There was God's presence. How did that priest, the high priest, twice a year, go into that place and know where to put the blood if it was dark? For it wasn't dark. For God is light. That high priest, when he pulled back that veil and went in there, he was a marvel. There's no light at all. And yet there's light coming from that mercy seat as he put the blood. What is the what is the, the uh, John Newton telling us? We're going to the holiest of holiest places ever, glory where God is, and there's not a spot or a light on the mercy seat. There is God, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit, and we're there in glory. We are seated there now. We are seated in heavenly places. Let us go before the throne of grace, Hebrews says. We're already there. Our body hasn't caught up. And life of joy and peace and no more death. All right. Now we got a problem. Now we got a big problem. And this is why I don't like uh, amazing grace. I think we need to take stanza six, which is in all the Baptist hymnals. I think we need to white it out, cross it out, erase it out. You know that 
the, the six stanza verse, whatever you want to call it, Amazing Grace, is not John Newton's work. Did you know that? Let me read you something. Let me move my thing over here just a little bit. We'll be able to turn it off. Those who have read Harriet Beecher Stowe's Mize have seen the coming up. No, you didn't see nothing. Shut up, lady. Shut up. We already done your hymn, and we already thrown your hymn in a garbage can. You didn't see God. You saw the northern troops coming and saving you guys. You know, this guy was a slave runner. He brought slaves over in the ship. So the slave book, the slave people have added to this hymn. And it needs to be removed. I'm not against slavery. Did I say that right? I'm not against it. I'm not for slavery. Let me say that. I may have said that wrong. But according to, if you read Harry Beecher Stowe, uh, the African-American novelist, if you want to call her that, Uncle Tom's Cabin, you may be reminded that Tom's singing three verses of Amazing Grace I didn't watch the book. I didn't read the book. I didn't watch any of the movie. So I don't know. This is what I'm told. That he sung three stanzas of Amazing Grace. And this stanza six, I said there's six stanzas. You check your hymn in your church, it's usually four. Two are missing. Sometimes three. Three are missing, but the one that needs to be removed is the one we're going to sing right now. And we sing this with, oh, great. It has nothing to do with John Newton. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. When, now, this is what uh, uh, the movie, the movie, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Tom's singing. When we've been there for 10,000 years, you are not in heaven for 10,000 years. You're not in heaven for one second. You're not there for one hour. You're not there for a day, a week, a month, a year. There is no time in eternity. When the heavens and earth are folded up and, and the great white throne judgment comes, just before that great white throne judgment, time stops. Eternity begins. I have a problem with adding to the Bible as such as stanza six, which has nothing to do with John Newton. I'm not even going to give you the name who, it's not even worth the name to be put in here. It has no business being put in Amazing Grace. And yet, in Baptist hymnals, you'll find verse six. And it's against the scriptures. I'll tell you what. Let's make some chocolate chip cookies, shall we? Get some cookie dough. Mmm. We'll get some nice chocolate chips. Yep. We'll get some water. And we'll get some cyanide. And we'll get some flour. And we'll... Cyanide? Cyanide? Wait a minute. You don't put cyanide in cookie, in cookie dough to make chocolate chip cookies. That will kill you. So does this stanza. In a hymn supposedly for the salvation grace of Jesus Christ, added by a woman and added by a movie that has nothing to do about God. When we've been 10,000 years, no, we're not going to be there 10,000 years. We don't age no more. This is the problem I have with Amazing Grace. Bright shining as the sun. Really? We're going to be shining? Give me scripture and verse on that one. You mean Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is going to be the light of the place. There'll be no need of a sun. There'll be no need of the moon. For Jesus Christ, the Lamb, shall light the place. Not us. Miss Beecher and her movie and her nonsense has made us to be Jesus. And my eyes have seen the coming up. Shut up. Shut up. We already did that hymn. Go back and look it up. We have no less days to sing God's praise 
than we first begun. A movie had added God. That, that ain't the God, my God. That ain't the God that saved uh, John Newton. I was going to say Isaac Newton. John Newton. And you put a disgrace to a man? Yes, he was a slave trader. How often, how wicked. Yet God had forgiven his sins. God had washed him clean. And you come in with your, your nonsense of your abolishment, of your uh, anti-slavery, and your, your, your nonsense book. And you destroyed amazing graves that is now in the Baptist hymnals. You go to Baptist Church Sunday if your church is open. And check it out. Stanza 6, we've been there for 10,000 years, bright and shiny as the sun. We've no less days to sing God praise than we have first begun. It's not John Newton's story. I'm not even going to tell you who it is. I'm not even going to tell you. You go look it up yourself. That has no place. Now, what about the five stanzas? I'll agree with the five stanzas. Amazing grace. You don't want me to sing. How sweet the sound that saved a wrench like me. I was once lost, but now I am found. Was blind, now I see. I showed you the scripture. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. My grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Personal testimony of John Newton. Through many dangerous toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Personal testimony, John Newton. Also scripture. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secure. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Scripture. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail, fail and mortal life shall see. I will possess within the veil, most holy, holy place, a life with joy and peace, and rank the rest of it out. You need to get a copy of the amazing grace I had. You need to white out that, that stanza number six and paste this over your amazing grace in your hymnal of your church. That's We've been there for that 10,000. No, you haven't been. You're not going to ever be there. You don't know nothing. See, your God was the northern army to come and protect you and set you free and put you in the ghettos in Chicago and New York City. That was your God. Your God gave you, uh, you know, welfare and everything like that. And I don't care you don't like what I'm saying. It's the truth. It's the truth. But the God that saved John Newton is in stanzas one through five. Yes, I would live the miserable, terrible, wicked life. God washed that all away. He was never a slave trader after that. Matter of fact, he went into the ministry. He went preaching the gospel and got people saved. So the problem I have with Amazing Grace is that six stanzas are not written by John Newton. I have no problem with the five. Keep the five and get rid of the six. But you see, in the church hymnals that we have, it's already been shortened down to four stanzas. Removing two stanzas of the of the saving grace or the amazing grace. I gotta keep looking at his name, John Newton. I keep wanting to say Isaac here. We have taken away the testimony of John Newton. And we had replaced it with abolition of slavery. That's a mockery. Yes, that's who John Newton was. Not in the eyes of God no more. And when you sing, we've been there 10,000 years. That's anti-scripture. That's arsenic in the Bible. Because I'll be there for all eternity. I won't have a wristwatch. There's no more time. So, if we can get the churches to remove that stanza that does not belong to John Newton and add the other two back in, glory to God.
one stanza makes this him puke for me. Now, let me ask you a question. All the military funeral, all the times I've heard Amazing Grace played on bagpipe. You think it's really when Jesus said, you know, the world hates you, no, it hated me first. Would you think that when John said, marvel not my brethren, the world hates you, you think the world plays Amazing Grace for the glory of God's grace? If stanza six was never there, in mockery, in mockery of what John Newton was, you think Amazing Grace would be a popular hymn? And there's no Jesus Christ. There's no Jesus Christ in any of the stanzas. I wish John Newton would have wrote Jesus in there. And the only place God shows up is by this guy who adds his own stanza. I mean, he puts the Lord, verse 4. The Lord has promised good to me. That hymn, that stanza is gone. They remove, yea, when the flesh and heart shall fail. That's gone. It is the, the, the promise of God and it is the fact that we may die one day outside the rapture. They are gone. But let's add something that has nothing to do with John Newton. I think when the world plays stanza six, I think they're mocking God. And I think they're mocking the God of John Newton. That's personally. Don't you put quote and unquote. I'm, I'm just, that's what I feel. My opinion. They're doing it to mock God. If you're really going to do it right and you're really going to sing to the glory of God, stands at one, two, three, four, and five. Plain and simple. I hate to ruin your day, but we do do the biblical truth of our hymns. We look at the hymns through what the Bible has to say. I don't care about what you feel. I don't care how you feel. I don't care. I care. I'm going to tell you right now. When my church sings stanza one, two, and three, stanza four, which will be stanza six, I'm not going to sing stanza six no more. I'll stop at though many years, dangerous toils. I've never already. I'll, that's it. When I'm, that's it. I'm not going to sing no more. If I can find a hymnal in the church that will sing stanza four and five, I will sing that. When it becomes a stanza six, I am not going to sing it. And when you sing that stanza, when you sing Amazing Grace, do you know the story of verses one, uh, stanzas one through five? Do you know it's the personal stanza of the life of John Newton? And then you know where stanza six came. It came from a movie. Ask your pastor. Say, Pastor, what do you feel about us going to movies? And if he says it's good and all that, you need to find a new pastor in a new church. Or, you know, and, and if he rebukes the movies and all that and say, hey, Stanza 6 was in a movie of Uncle Tom's Cabin, wherever that was. Mockery. It's mocking a slave runner. Who had no knowledge of sin until the amazing grace came and I probably made many enemies right now but God loves me that's all it counts